So we now have 11 supercarriers. By the end of this decade, we'll have 14. One of them is more powerful than all but nine of the air forces on the planet. And that assumes a fair fight. And the whole idea of a Navy is it's never a fair fight because ships move. You know, we learned this from you. Uh, and so it's really one of their new supercarriers can take on any but one of three air forces in the world. And we're going to have 14 of them. Uh, so that's great if you want to knock off a country. If you want to patrol the global oceans, no, 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 because you can only be in 14 places at once. And that assumes they're all at sea, which never happens. So we no longer even have the military structure that is necessary to guarantee global commerce. No country in the world does. So the most likely outcome of this is we'll get a series of regional powers that have military force that is capable of kind of making a bubble, a little sphere of influence, and there will be trade within those bubbles. But the trade between the bubbles is going to be very, very sketchy, uh, difficult to regulate, difficult to protect, and by definition can't really be very long distance. Well, Pre-World War II it was usually imperial competition. Uh, if you didn't have something that you thought you needed, you went out and you took it. And if somebody else had it, you had a nice little war with a naval component. Uh, during the Cold War, it has been, I'm sorry, just during the post-Cold War era, piracy has come back in a very big way. Uh, it's more an irritant, but if you look back to pre-World War II, privateering was all kinds of fun. And the idea that you didn't have to go out and raid your opponent's shipping yourself, you could just hire someone to do it. By... I mean, you can have state piracy, basically using your military to grab things direct. You can have privateering, where you rely on third parties to do it and provide safe harbor. Uh, and then you can have flat-out piracy. Uh, we've dealt with all of them in the past. We're going to have to deal with all of them in the future. Oh, dear God. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I just wrote this book. <laughs> Uh, the, the book split into six big chapters based on the various economic sectors. So transport, finance, energy, industrial commodities, agriculture, manufacturing. Uh, everything that we understand uh, about all six is dependent upon the idea of global security. And so you remove the global security and all six of them have to unwind and reform in different ways. So really it's kind of pick your poison. With transport, long haul goes out the window. That's an end to, among other things, super tankers. So if you are getting your oil from 3,000 or more miles away, you're out of luck. Um, ships are going to have to be smaller and go faster because the concentrated risk that a giant container vessel has, you lose one of those and the shipping company goes away. If you're doing smaller tankers or smaller ships that are going faster, they can't carry as much. You just lost most intermediate goods trade. That's an end to electronics manufacturing in its current form. So you can play this on really any topic that you want, but the structures that have all held it together and made it work are dependent upon the ceiling not falling. And it's falling. We established penalties for people who didn't play. And because the Americans started with Europe, which was the headquarters of most of the empires, it stuck. Uh, the only non-European empire that mattered at the time was the Soviet Union, which was the target of all this, and Japan, which was subjugated. So everyone who in the past had been a, a bad actor, if you want to use that very loaded term, all of a sudden was on the same side. Everyone who had ever had a projection-based military throughout human history was in the same coalition. I would say that there's not a lot of light between me and those names. I mean, obviously, when you get into the details, analysts can quibble about everything. They, and they can, they do, absolutely. Uh, but the, the, the core idea that without energy, none of this works is solid. Um, we've spent the last 70 years bringing the energy from where it's produced to where it's consumed, which means primarily from the Middle East to Europe and East Asia. North America is more or less a self-contained component, even was before the shale revolution. Now it certainly is. Um, that was one of the prices the Americans paid in order to get their alliances, making sure the energy would flow. In the environment we're in now, we're at a risk of losing all Russian crude. Now, I've always thought this was going to happen eventually. I didn't think it was going to happen this soon. Uh, Russian crude is what has largely fueled the global economic expansion since 92. Because when the Soviet system collapsed, their energy production did not, and all of their commodities were just dumped on the international market. 
And that has kept prices relatively low for 35 years. That period is now closing. And so we're going to lose 5% of global crude, which doesn't sound like a big deal until you remember that energy demand is inelastic. And a 5% loss in crude can easily generate a tripling in price. So an energy-induced depression that is broadly global in scope will start because of the Ukraine war at some point. And this is probably the reason that no one's gone after that raft yet, because that would be the death blow for the Russian energy sector. The math is going to be different for everybody. But like take, take Latvia. Latvia has the capacity to do this. All they have to do is grab one shuttle tanker as it's leaving St. Petersburg. That would do it. And the Latvians have already managed to wean themselves off of Russian crude. And while it would crush most of their European partners, they would see the destruction of the primary income stream for Russia as an unalloyed good. Or consider the Americans. We're self-sufficient. We have the capacity of putting a wall around our energy exports so they stay at home. So we could actually see energy prices in the U.S. go down because of this. But then the rest of the world would lose access to Russian and American crude at the same time. So everyone has their own math to run. And a lot of it is going to depend upon how everyone interprets the loyalty or the actions of their allies. So, I mean, look at Germany. And the Russians are in the process of jerking with this Oman on natural gas. And you know, for those of us in the rest of the world, like natural gas, it's an energy source. Whatever, no biggie. That's not what it is in Germany. The entire German economy is based on talking cheap Russian gas, processing it to petrochemical and then using those imports in their entire manufacturing sector. If they lose that gas, it's not just the electricity prices go off. It's that the German manufacturing model fails. So the Germans are being presented with head choice. Leave the coalition and keep the lights on, or lose your gas and no longer be modern. So what's more important that the Germans being Western or being modern? That's a that's a shit so yes. But it has consequences, and people will judge them based on what they do. Time fire, especially if we were a country that had a pretty good geography at the start of this war. Then when the Americans came through and changed the rules. So that everyone can play, you saw a massive drop in your overall power. If we are one of those countries and you have a positive demographic structure, you could actually make a lot of hay out of what's coming because you could. I don't want to use the word imperial, narrow imperial might be the right word. You can definitely make a bit for your own neighborhood. So the two countries that are on the top of my list as regard that are Turkey and France. Decent demographics, good manufacturing base, largely not introgate into their neighborhoods economically. The France actually trade less with the EU than the Brits do. Fun fact. And I can see part of Western Europe becoming part of a France favorite And obviously parts of the Middle East for Turkey. I would have put Japan on the list. But the Japanese managed to cut a deal with both Donald Trump and Joe Biden, which makes the Japanese the only people who have been able to get on on with both sides of American spectrum of late. So I think they basically agreed to partner up with the US rather than go their own way, which I think will be the best for everyone in the long term. Unless you are Chinese, of course. How was the UK going to do? That's up to you. You really need to figure out this Brexit thing. I mean, is it's just, yes, you have left, but you still don't have any plan for what's next. And that is really hurting you with every day that that is pushed off your negotiation forward with whatever the structure of the future end of looking like a going to be a waker and waker. And you are very rapidly getting to the point where the only option you are going to have is a trade deal with the United States on American terms. There are worse things that could happen, but we will be as the best way to face this. We will be as gentle in the negotiation as we are during the Ledlick talks where you basically had to give up half of the hemisphere of military presence in exchange for 40 destroyer that we are used to laugh at because they were so bad. Okay, thank you for watching Geopolitics Resource.